En 1990, Vanilla Ice era el rey de las tablas del pop. Vendía millones de discos y dominaba la radio. Solo cuatro años más tarde, era ridiculizado como un éxito pasajero y una noche de invierno sus amigos lo encontraron inconsciente en el piso de su baño. La depresión sobre su carrera tanking fue solo matando a él, así que ingestó un gran amount de cocaína, ecstasy y alcohol. You know, knowing full well that the amount could have killed him. Bro, I was lost. I had a weekend that lasted a few years. And uh, by saying that is I didn't know where I fit in, so basically I turned to drugs as an escape route. Fue un giro inesperado para un artista que solo unos años antes había encontrado el estrellato con el mega éxito Ice Ice Baby. In three weeks, it moves six million copies. You couldn't go to a drugstore, a barber shop, or the grocery store without hearing it on the radio. Pero unos años más tarde, todo se derrumbó. Ice era el asma reír de la cultura pop. I look back at everything and I go, you know, this is not, a, this is not what I wanted. The baggy pants, the hairdos and stuff, it's not what I wanted to be recognized for. It was, it was really the music. Lo que había comenzado como una pasión genuina, lo había llevado a una vida fuera de control. Vanilla Ice nació como Robert Van Winkle el día de Noche de Brujas de 1968. Criado en Dallas, el niño enfrentó su primera adversidad cuando su padre abandonó a la familia. I was really young. I never missed him or anything or had any curiosities because it was filled in by Byron. Byron Mino, un vendedor de autos y cantante de ópera, entró en escena al poco tiempo al casarse con su madre. My mentor, just the coolest dude, person, father, figure you could ever have. You know, he was really there for me. Mino apoyó la pasión del joven Rob por el motocross competitivo. Su madre fue una presencia constante y no solo le dio un hogar lleno de amor, sino también de apreciación y talento para la música. Su madre es actually classically trained pianist. She plays guitar and she does the flute. Very unique and talented musically. He was always interested in funk music. I mean, he loved James Brown, for instance. That was a huge idol for him. And so when hip hop came along, he was like, oh my God, this is my kind of music. I didn't know that there wasn't other white people doing the same thing. I just, it just, it's what influenced me. And as soon as hip hop came out, you know, I was really fascinated with it right off the bat because it was basically they took funk and then they rhymed over it. Pero no fue hasta que Ice vio el clásico de culto Breaking que comenzó a pensar que tendría un lugar en la cultura que tanto admiraba. They had the broom and he would pop lock and do his whole thing, you know, and I was just like trying to mimic the moves and stuff and I had a little mirror in my room, so I'd go in my room at night and be like I can do it, you know, I can do it. His first real foray into public attention was of course as a break dancer. He would do some uh, freestyle rapping and break dancing in uh, in clubs, uh, mostly African American clubs. I used to have a piece of cardboard, I'd make 40 bucks a day and uh, spin on my head with my little break dancing crew. Uh, my friends called me Vanilla, which I hated because I thought it was kind of like, you just call me that because I'm white, but that kind of stuck as a nickname. <laughs> Vanilla I. Aunque visitaba los clubes por la noche, Ice seguía en la secundaria durante el día. Él y sus amigos ensayaban en la cafetería escolar. And we would crack on each other, rap on each other. Oh, your mama's got dirty socks and you know stuff like that. I would go home thinking, what can I come back for lunchtime tomorrow and come back because my friend he got me good today. So I'm gonna come back on him tomorrow. So I would think of these rhymes. Mientras que Ice practicaba sus rimas en secreto, el rap y el hip hop se estaban diversificando como artes. DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince and their brand of pop rap. Hip hop was picking up on some suburban themes. It was being more directed toward the youth. So all of a sudden on MTV you had artists like NWA who were more hardcore gangster rap. But you also had a lot of artists who were very pop oriented, very mall oriented. Aunque un adolescente blanco y suburbano difícilmente encajaba en la escena del hip hop local, Ice lo hacía. You know, my mom told me white kids don't rap. People tell me, you know, don't do that. And I'm the kind of guy that just believes in himself. But I'm on a path. And I'm going to walk my path never narrow. I'm going to walk it wide. Like I own it. Ahí se acercó a difíciles vecindarios afroamericanos buscando la música que pronto se volvería su obsesión. It's break dancing during the day at the mall on a piece of cardboard and uh, hitting some clubs at night. Y fue en un club local llamado City Lights donde la vida de Vanilla Ice dio un giro dramático. They had a talent contest there one night. 
I'm, I'm sitting there and my friend dares me to get up on stage and I'm like, no, nah, man. He goes, man, you can tear. Look at all these people up there, bro. You can outdance them, man. You can outdo perform these people. So I was like, all right, I'll do it when I, for fun, you know? So I was just I was spinning on my head a little bit and I got up and I grabbed the microphone, acapella, no beat, playing nothing and just busted out a rhyme. And they were just like, whoa. Ice no sabía que el público estaba repleto de contactos de la industria musical que buscaban a la próxima estrella. Luego del concierto se le acercó el dueño del club. I mean Kwan, who owns City Lights and was very involved in the record industry. The moment he saw Vanilla on stage, he was like, this is gold. Kwan se convirtió en el representante de Vanilla Ice y lo conectó con una discográfica. So long story short, I met, I got a, a small record deal uh, out of Atlanta called Ichiban Records. Ichiban envió a Ice al estudio con un presupuesto mínimo para grabar sus canciones. Una de las canciones del disco era una pista que Ice había compuesto cuando solo tenía 16 años, Ice Ice Baby. My DJ Earthquake had a uh, SP-1200, it was like a sampling machine that he got at a pawn shop. And I had a, a bunch of records and stuff, you know, my brother's old records, and that was one of them, Queen David Bowie, and we just threw that in there, oh, that sounds good. El sample fue casi un detalle menor pero cambiaría la vida de Vanilla Ice para siempre. En 1989, Vanilla Ice solo era un chico blanco de los suburbios que amaba rapear y hacer breakdance. Pero cuando participó de un concurso de talento en un club local, capturó la atención de los ejecutivos discográficos de inmediato e Ichiban Records se quedó con él. Unos meses más tarde se lanzó el primer disco de Ice, Hooked. Actually looked at a piece of wax with my recordings on it. I think I slept with it. El disco apenas vendió 38,000 copias, pero le permitió a Ice obtener más trabajo como músico. I was uh, on the Stop the Violence tour with Ice T, Stetsasonic, Mix a Lot. I was the opening act for the opening act for the opening act for the opener. <laughs> I didn't care. I was just so thrilled and excited to tell all my friends. Incluso como un desconocido, Ice sentía que estaba viviendo su sueño. La música era su pasión y no habría vuelta atrás. El primer simple era una interpretación de Play That Funky Music White Boy de Wild Cherry. Ice Ice Baby apenas era el lado B. A DJ in Georgia flipped the record and thought that Ice Ice Baby had something to it. And then it was just like this phenomenal thing just took off. En cuanto las radios de Atlanta comenzaron a pasar Ice Ice Baby, las líneas telefónicas estallaron. Of course, everybody thought I was black because all hip hop was black at the time, right? I mean, because there was no video on me yet, because I didn't have any money to buy a or pay for a video. The song goes to number one on this station in Georgia, and then a station in Tennessee plays it, and then a station in Dallas plays it, and then record companies started sniffing a hit. Las compañías discográficas ya estaban buscando cómo capitalizar la popularidad creciente del rap. There were things happening that record companies were paying close attention to. The Beastie Boys, Tone Loke, and MC Hammer. Así que cuando Charles Koppelman, un ejecutivo de SBK, supo del nuevo artista, fue todo oídos. An attorney friend of mine called and said that there was this um, artist named Vanilla Ice who had a record out that was independently distributed called Ice Ice Baby and it was doing incredibly well at radio and they had a deal that they were about to sign with Atlantic Records but there was a glitch in the deal and would I be interested and he played me Ice Ice Baby over the phone and I instantly thought this was a monster hit record Ice rápidamente firmó un contrato con SBK Records por un avance de 250 mil dólares. I was about, I guess, 19. That's when I signed a major record label. It, it seems like it happened overnight to most people, but there was about three years of, you know, going through the trenches, of hard work and, you know, no pay and trying to just get out there and, and, and get my name out there and do whatever I can do to, you know, get to the next step. SBK se convenció de que finalmente habían encontrado a quien llevaría el rap al gusto popular. He was this uh, tall, strong, handsome, uh, charismatic uh, artist. 
Hooked fue reempaquetado y relanzado como el disco To The Extreme y con la fuerza de una discográfica grande detrás, Ice Ice Baby explotó. Ice Ice Baby is released to radio. Eight weeks later, it's the number one song in America. It was the jam. I mean, it was like move over MC Hammer. Everyone was singing this song. Because I'm a lyrical poet. Find me from a scene just in case you didn't know it. My town. I was celebrating my first gold record. Within a day later, they presented a platinum record to me. One week later, double platinum. Two weeks, triple. It's sold over like 40 million now. It's ridiculous. He went from just kind of being a normal guy, you know, trying to get some music out there, just dabbling with some stuff, and then next thing you know, it, it just it took off. I mean, superstardom overnight. I had no idea when I was doing it that it was any better than any of my other songs or any different or anything. De pronto, Ice era más rico y famoso de lo que jamás había soñado. And here in New York City, I've never been here before. They're taking me on helicopter and plane rides around Statue of Liberty. Here, you want a Rolls Royce? Here, let's just do it. Pero un momento en particular sobresale hasta el día de hoy. One of the best thrills I ever got was uh, getting my mom a house, taking care of her. And she was like, man. You did it. <laughs> Con la canción dominando las radios, estaba claro que el rap finalmente había llegado al centro de los Estados Unidos. Muchos vieron el color blanco de Ice como algo esencial para su éxito. Here comes a white guy who's doing rap and uh, it's palatable to, you know, American audiences and it wasn't as threatening to American households as some of the black rappers were. This kind of good-looking white kid who's sort of acting like a black kid. I think the fact that he was white you know, um, helped his career at that time tremendously. Vanilla Ice was not the first white rapper. You know, before him, you definitely had Beastie Boys who'd come out and sell millions of records. You had Third Bass who had a lot of credibility in the hip hop community. But Vanilla Ice was the first rapper in the mainstream to really use whiteness as a gimmick. He presented a kind of, uh, I don't know if I want to say sanitized, but he domesticated rap to some extent. Fuera cual fuera la razón, estaba claro que el panorama musical había cambiado para siempre. My record is the first rap song ever to be played on a, on a pop station. In other words, I put rap music in front of people's ears who have never considered listening to rap music. Those people out in the middle of America. The times were right. Uh, for this particular artist at that particular time. Mientras que Ice salía de gira y actuaba sin descanso, SBK trabajaba detrás de escenas para capitalizar su éxito. Interestingly, Vanilla Ice was only number one for one week because the record label decided to withdraw the retail single to try to fuel sales of the album. La estrategia funcionó. To The Extreme se volvió el disco número uno en el país y acabó la racha de 22 semanas de MC Hammer. La cabeza de Ice daba vueltas. Everything happened so fast, it took on a life of its own. And uh, I figured that since I'm signed to a major label and I'm so young, I don't know anything about all this stuff, you know what I mean? I'm like, just kind of let them drive the ship. Ice pronto se vio rodeado de consejeros y representantes. I got uh, these people all around me telling me to do this and do that. I have publicists over here, you know, telling me to say these things in interviews. Next day, oh, we need to dress up your whole stage show to make you more glittery. Okay, okay, okay. They gave him the big, baggy MC Hammer pants. They shaved his eyebrows, a sort of signature look for him. Mientras que Vanilla comenzaba a sentirse manipulado, SBK Records solo sentía que multiplicaba el valor de su exitoso artista. He was what you know him as. We didn't change him. This was who he was. It's the artist's vision. It's, we're, we're not, uh, uh, this isn't American Idol. La tensión llegó a su punto máximo cuando la discográfica le presentó otro pedido a Ice. MC Hammer had a slow song. LL Cool J had a slow song. Vanilla's got to have a slow song. I said, I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. I went in the office. I said, I don't do slow songs. It's gay. I don't want to do this, man. It's not for me. Here's a million dollars. We do it now. Where do I go? <laughs> Whatever I might have wanted him to do, uh, that would be good for my record company, would 100% be good for him. So whatever I would suggest for him to do was only for his good. These guys are good, believe me. Charles Koppelman is the best. Anytime I said, there's no way he's going to talk me into this one, I'd walk in his office and I'd walk out of there. 
million bucks, you know, richer. They would do that to me. They would pay me off with things. I'm sure we had some differences. I don't really remember them. But uh, most often we prevailed. And I think we prevailed primarily because he was smart enough to understand that, that, that we actually knew. Ice Ice Baby era un éxito y no había motivo para cuestionar las estrategias de SBK. Vanilla Ice no tenía idea de que las cosas estaban por cambiar. I had this huge extreme high. Beyond anybody they could ever imagine. Sold more records than Michael Jackson, Madonna. I'm way up there. I'm, I'm on this high and they had an equal low. Had an equal low. And that equal low I couldn't handle. En 1990, Ice Ice Baby rompía récords como la primera canción de rap en llegar al primer puesto. Not only was he popular in the urban market, he was popular in sort of the suburban market too. I mean, you couldn't go to a drugstore, a barber shop, or the grocery store without hearing it on the radio. Pero a medida que el éxito aumentaba, la gente comenzó a hablar de la particular base de la canción, claramente una copia de Under Pressure de Queen y David Bowie. It was a fairly new phenomenon to bring back old hits sampled as a hook and then add the new artist over top. What happened is, is I took one piece out of their song. That's it. Everything else was an original song. In fact, the whole song was done and then we threw that in later. You know, but yeah, of course that loop is from their record. Absolutely. Aunque el parecido lo agregaron como un detalle, muchos lo vieron como algo más. You take that under pressure riff out of Ice Ice Baby, you've got virtually nothing left. When Ice Ice Baby finally becomes this huge hit, it's like, holy crap, no one actually bothered to get permission from them, from Queen and from David Bowie. En esa época era común que los artistas ampliaran libremente sin pedir permiso. It was the beginning of sampling, so there were no hot and fast rules as there are now. It was a, more of a negotiation. You could just do them and get away with it because nobody was selling any records. The minute I did the same thing they did and sold millions of records, then there's some money to go after. Vanilla Ice intentó brevemente decir que la línea de bajo en verdad era original, pero pronto dijo que bromeaba. Anyone who's going to claim that this isn't the David Bowie Queen song simply with a rap over top is nuts. And Vanilla Ice even knew better. Anyone who listens to that one time, I mean, they know that it's being sampled, and you know that you're going to have to deal with it. Luego de que Ice Ice Baby alcanzara el número uno, haber usado esos samples resultó ser un error muy costoso. I paid four uh, million dollars to uh, David Bowie and Queen. I paid about eight million dollars to uh, Wild Cherry uh, for play that funky music, and another couple million for all the other little samples I had on the record. Pero incluso luego de que los samples del disco fueran licenciados y pagados, Vanilla Ice se encontró bajo el escrutinio del público y de la prensa masiva. Sampling was done way before I came along, and I'm thinking everybody knows that, but I didn't know that my record was the first time they heard it, so then I was kind of criticized about that. Oh, he stole that. That's Queen David Bowie. I know that song. Of course it is. Y cuando surgieron preguntas acerca de la biografía oficial lanzada por SBK Records, no hicieron más que alimentar las llamas de la controversia. They wrote up this fake biography with all these details like, oh, you know, he was from the projects in Atlanta. He went to school with uh, Luther Campbell from Two Live Crew. Uh, no, he didn't. Luther Campbell's like seven years older than this guy. It says right here, you'd said that you dance better than MC Hammer. I was like, it does? What are you talking about? I never said that. According to him, he had no idea that SBK had released an official artist bio to the press. He had no idea what was in it. It was never run past him. He never okayed it. Cuando Vanilla Ice insistió en que él no sabía nada sobre la publicación de su biografía falsa, la discográfica afirmó exactamente lo contrario. All the information we got, we got from Ice and from uh, Tommy Kwan. We didn't, uh, we didn't make anything up, nor, nor would we. El 18 de noviembre de 1990, un investigador periodístico del Dallas Morning News publicó un artículo desacreditando gran parte de la biografía de SBK. After the, the fake bio came to light, the press really had it in for Vanilla Ice. All of a sudden, he's a terrible performer. He samples what he shouldn't sample. All of a sudden, people don't like the way he dresses, the way he dances, the way he acts. Meses después salió Ice by Ice, The Vanilla Ice Story in His Own Words. El libro reiteraba mucho de lo que ya había sido desacreditado, dando un golpe más a la credibilidad ya inestable de Ice. Remember, this was around the time of Millie Vanilli. People were really, really, you know, suspicious of anything that smelled fake. So, you know, his 
Para cuando ICE aceptó el American Music Award a Mejor Artista Nuevo en 1991, ya se sentía atacado. Negative press gets bigger news than positive press. Vanilla Ice talks this, Vanilla Ice says this. If it's negative, it's like, how, you know, it goes to the top. Pronto la credibilidad no fue el único problema de Vanilla Ice. Cuando una noche recibió una visita sorpresiva del empresario del hip hop, Shook Knight. He came into my hotel room. I opened the door and there's a whole gang of football player sized guys in there and I'm like, wow. He has all these stacks of paper. He tells me, basically you want to You know, you want to play, you gotta pay. Knight le dijo a Ice que había venido para representar a un rapero de Dallas que afirmaba haber coescrito Ice Ice Baby. Essentially, Suge Knight felt that he was owed some royalties or some rights to Vanilla Ice's music. I'm like, all right. So he took a few million bucks. There's actually this huge urban legend that Suge dangled Vanilla Ice over the balcony by his ankles, you know, like threatening to kill the guy. Um, and, and that's what terrified Vanilla into, into signing over the royalties. Suge Knight did not dangle me from no balcony. It never happened. In fact, he was never mean to me. He was never rude, mean, nothing. Um, he was forceful. Nobody really knows what happened at that meeting. Was there a co-writer to Ice Ice Baby? Who knows? All we do know is that, according to Vanilla Ice, he handed over a sizable sum to Suge Knight. Mientras que los rumores y las leyendas han persistido, Ice ve el lado positivo de ese episodio. I look at it in a roundabout way uh, that I contributed to some of the best hip hop music ever made. Because with that money that he got from me, right, he started Death Row Records. Tras recibir un fuerte golpe económico. Ice debía poner su carrera de nuevo en marcha. Con la ayuda de SBK Records, Ice apareció nuevamente, comenzando con la película Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. It was a way for us to try and elongate this career and to, to try and find another audience for him. Pero la nueva aparición convirtió a Vanilla Ice en motivo de burla. For 10-year-old boys, ninja rap was like the coolest thing out there. For kind of like, you know, the urban street hip hop community, mm, didn't really do wonders for his credibility. Rapping with turtles? No. Ninja rap, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Still a fan to this day. Love it. <laughs> There's no shame in my game, man. I've had therapy. En un último intento de mantener en marcha la máquina de Vanilla Ice, protagonizó su propia película Cool as Ice. He stars in this film called Cool as Ice. Okay, there's your first red flag. Second red flag, it's loosely based on James Dean's Rebel Without a Cause. Okay, red flag number two, three, and four. This bad boy biker gang member, Vanilla Ice, who uh, goes through a small town and of course meets this good girl. The white hip hop Fonzie for the 1990s is the best way I could describe him. And he has all these awesome catchphrases in the movie. Drop that zero and give it the hero. It's one of those movies, if you can get your hands on, uh, is fun to watch when you uh, want to have a good laugh. A pesar de las terribles críticas y de la tibia respuesta del público a Cool as Ice, en 1992 Vanilla Ice experimentó otra ventaja del estrellato, salir con Madonna. She came to me. It was in New York City. First time I met her and I did a, a show there. And I look out during my show. And there's Madonna. Bam. Los dos comenzaron un fogoso romance, pero las cosas cambiaron cuando Madonna publicó su infame libro Sex con un Vanilla Ice parcialmente desnudo. She did it without permission from me. And pretty much that was it. I, I, I didn't like that, you know. Vanilla Ice llevaba los últimos tres años trabajando sin parar, pero el público comenzaba a cansarse de él. Anytime that your image is almost bigger than the music that's associated with you. You you become a target. That wave pretty much that I was riding hit the shore. Parodias de Ice y su trabajo comenzaron a aparecer por doquier. Third base put out a song called Pop Goes the Weasel that just really blasted Vanilla Ice. So they hired punk rock icon Henry Rollins to play Vanilla Ice. He's got the Vanilla Ice hair, he's saying word to your mother. And in the end third base beats him up with some baseball bats. Kevin Bacon on Saturday Night Live on the NatX show with Chris Rock it was hilarious. How do they make it look like you can dance? I mean, did they do something with the camera? Did they get a black body double? Oh man, no, that was me dancing, man. I do all my own steps. Word to your mother. Probably the parody to end all parodies of Vanilla Ice was, of course, that done by Jim Carrey. 
white, white baby. It was one of those parodies that was so spot on that it forever changed the way you looked at that video, the way you heard that song, and the way you looked at the artist. En 1994, Vanilla Ice salió con un nuevo estilo, un nuevo sonido y una nueva actitud. He was trying to tap into the uh, suddenly very marketable marijuana craze in hip hop. He was trying to play off of groups like Cypress Hill and Funk Dubious. All of a sudden, he'd become this kind of stoner, uh, uh, dreadlock kind of guy, which showed a changing of his musical style, but there was something about that that seemed, I don't know, desperate. Las ventas fueron pésimas y su carrera estaba casi acabada. Ice se encontró en una situación muy oscura. Found myself uh, writing a suicide note and trying to kill myself. I actually wanted to die with 30 million bucks in the bank. A comienzos de los 90, Ice Ice Baby de Vanilla Ice dominaba las tablas del pop, pero pronto Ice descubrió que la fama era un juego efímero. Vanilla Ice was almost the victim of his own enormous success. When you hear Ice Ice Baby all the time, and when you see Vanilla Ice's face everywhere, you're gonna get a backlash. The timing was everything. It was huge because of the timing. We hit him right at the right time, and it was... It was dogged out right at the right time because anything that's going to go as long as my record did, two or three years of just vanilla eyes over and over and over, I get sick of it. So I knew there's going to be some some point it's got to go, you know, down. Para 1994, Vanilla Ice era considerado un fracaso. Tras un segundo disco decepcionante, Ice se encontró sin tener idea de a dónde se dirigía. I wrote Ice Ice Baby when I was 16 years old. I didn't know where I fit in in life after you know the huge amount of fame and everything to just go out and be myself again. I didn't know who myself was. When you think of what it must be like to, you know, one year, 1991, be this huge star, and then all of a sudden, in a matter of 24, 36 months, to have all of that kind of disappear, that has got to really be rough on any human being. Unfortunately, you know, in, in our world, uh, you get your 15 minutes of fame, the media builds you up as quickly as they can, and then they take you down as quickly as they can. En su desesperación, ahí se volcó a las drogas. I didn't want to face reality at all, so I, I turned to uh, ecstasy, and cocaine, and lots of alcohol. It was hard. He was buried in such a cloud. He had just hit rock bottom. Y una fría noche de enero de 1994, Vanilla Ice se encontró solo, encerrado en su baño. I found myself uh, writing a suicide note and trying to kill myself. I actually wanted to die. Money didn't do anything. Couldn't buy myself friends. Couldn't find a bit of happiness anywhere I looked. A pesar de la enorme cantidad de drogas que Vanilla Ice había ingerido, sus amigos pudieron revivirlo. His friends weren't, were not there for that time. It could have been drastic. I don't know how I survived it. I took enough drugs to kill an army that night. Al comprender que debía cambiar drásticamente su vida, Vanilla Ice lentamente emergió de la oscuridad. It was lonely at first. I didn't have any friends. I just changed my phone numbers, where I lived, kind of hibernated. La transformación personal de Ice continuó cuando inesperadamente el amor llegó a su vida. I met my wife at a party I had on 4th of July. She slipped me her phone number. <laughs> I think he... Didn't really want to be that person, but was lost. And I think that once he found somebody that he really thought cared about him, he turned over a new leaf and we were on to a new chapter. There we are, <laughs> 14 years later. <laughs> Con su vida personal en orden, Vanilla Ice también decidió avanzar en una nueva dirección musical al unirse con Ross Robinson, un productor que había trabajado con bandas como Korn, Limp Bizkit y Deftones. He had a way of teaching me to make music that I didn't even know existed before. Para Ice, hacer música siempre fue entretenimiento. People don't want to hear music to be depressed. People don't want to hear angry music. They want to put a music on and be like, yeah, let's jump around, man, great times, put a smile on everybody's face. Pero Ross convenció a Ice de canalizar el dolor de su pasado. El disco resultante, Hard to Swallow, fue un proyecto profundamente personal que guarda un lugar especial en el corazón de Vanilla Ice. It was a time that happened that is caught on tape that transformed me into, I guess, whatever I am today. I owe, I owe everything to him, man. He really saved my life. 
Save My Life. Aunque las ventas fueron modestas, igual tocó profundamente a algunos. Mientras que un grupo selecto disfrutaba de la nueva música de Vanilla Ice, el resto del mundo aún lo asociaba con sus logros del pasado, lo cual quedó en claro cuando MTV invitó a Ice para aparecer en uno de sus especiales. MTV's 25 Lame, a 1999 special where four people sit around the set and kind of uh, make fun of um, uh, the lamest videos ever. It was Janine Garofalo, Dennis Leary, Chris Catan. And none other than John Stewart. El plan era que los comediantes se burlaran del video de Ice Ice Baby, lo cual culminaría con Vanilla Ice en persona destrozando una copia. Pero cuando Ice llegó al estudio, comenzó a tener dudas. My video? I'm gonna destroy my own video. Yes, I hate my image. Yes, I hate everything. I love the video. I worked my ass off for that video. It was the number one video in the country. So I'm thinking, you want me to destroy this? Well, how about I destroy your set? How about I destroy everything here that you did? And he smashes the entire set. <laughs> he destroyed the glass table. There was like glass and broken pieces of wood and shards everywhere. Bam! Hit the popcorn, it flew in the air. People thought this guy was really coming unhinged. But you know, I mean, it was a really vulnerable moment of him. He's going on the show and they're basically making fun of the guy. That's the whole point of this show. He Parecía que Vanilla Ice luchaba con su pasado. Pero pronto Ice tendría problemas mucho más grandes con los cuales lidiar. Acabó bajo arresto por atacar a su esposa. Para el 2001, Vanilla Ice había sido virtualmente olvidado por el público. He was experimenting with different sounds, different images, different styles, working with different producers, but you know, unfortunately none of them ever really caught on. People knew him as Ice Ice Baby and that was it. Con su carrera en ruinas, las cosas estaban por empeorar mucho cuando su esposa, Laura Van Winkle, hizo un llamado frenético. 911 emergency. Yeah, I need a police to come out to the place. My husband hit me. I'm so sorry, bitch. You need to get away from him. I want him out of here. He was driving along with his wife and they got into this altercation, which was allegedly physical. Ice fue arrestado por violencia y la prensa tuvo un festín. It's not something that I'm proud of or anything like that, but uh, it happened and if anything it brought us closer. Rob is not, you know, an abusive man. You know, we've gotten into a few fights and we've worked it out. After the alleged physical assault, he was sentenced to probation and family therapy. Tras reconciliarse con su esposa, Vanilla Ice continuó haciendo música, pero su disco siguiente, Bipolar, fue lanzado con poca repercusión. Parecía estar destinado al desconocimiento tras el éxito fugaz cuando un nuevo reality show llegó para sacudir a la cultura pop. So real life, of course, was to take the concept of the real world, but instead of putting regular people in the uh, house or apartment, you put in a bunch of funny has been stars, celebrities, actors, whatever. Una vez que comenzó la filmación, los nuevos compañeros de casa de Ice descubrieron que su exterior tranquilo ocultaba una ira profunda. We had an incident where we had to bake cookies and go down the street and share them with the neighbors, and he got, he went off. You don't like celebrities? You're in Los Angeles, you stupid German. And I'm watching him going, man, you can't do that. Don't say that, man. And I'm walking down the street, and I said, wow, this guy is really a loose cannon. Pero Ice recibió una inesperada oportunidad para cicatrizar en el programa cuando el grupo visitó un bar de karaoke y dos de sus compañeras decidieron cantar Ice Ice Baby. And I sat next to him and I said, come on Ice, they're killing your song, man. He says, oh man, I don't know. I said, hey listen man, you're one of a kind, you're an original, you know, do your song, man. So I pull up the mic and listen to me, he goes, then he got a smile and he took it. And he got into it. So that was like a breakthrough for him. You know, that's the cool thing about that show is it was an adventure that I get to go on there. I get to hang out with all the other people on there and you get to hear their stories and the side and everything. It was really a cool experience. Con su real life detrás de él, un mundo de realities parecía abrirse. Y con la personalidad extrovertida de Vanilla Ice, era una combinación soñada. <laughs> I really don't like this 
Ahí se mantuvo ocupado apareciendo en una serie de reality shows, desde The Farm en Reino Unido hasta Celebrity Boxing y Celebrity Ball Riding. Celebrity Cowboy Ty Murray invites nine stars to his ranch for kind of a bull riding boot camp. And it was a perfect fit for Vanilla Ice because with his motocross background, he has a real love of danger and adrenaline sports. Aunque Ice disfrutó mucho del programa, para muchos parecía ser una elección de carrera cuestionable. If reality TV like The Surreal Life are already on the B level of television, then we of course started getting the B level of B television. So uh, uh, we get celebrity bull riding, which makes celebrity boxing look like masterpiece theater. Finalmente apareció un reality show que demostraría el talento de Vanilla Ice cuando lo invitaron para aparecer en Hit Me Baby One More Time. Once famous musicians uh, onto the stage and they would sing their biggest hit song and then they would sing a cover of a contemporary hit. Hit Me Baby One More Time was a... Uh was a great experience. I got a chance to actually compete against these other groups. What was nice about this show is it wasn't just something to make fun of these people. I mean, it allowed you to kind of see these people that you may have actually really liked once upon a time. Y cuando Ice finalmente ganó la competencia, fue una especie de reivindicación. My most memorable, exciting moments Out of all the things that we've done, I was jumping up and down. I was a little rusty, but I did it. I pulled it off. Pero Ice pronto perdería el agrado por los realities luego de aceptar aparecer en un programa de renovaciones llamado Remaking Vanilla Ice, en el que un equipo de expertos trabajaba para actualizar su imagen. Here's a show after my whole experience with the, the record, the music industry, um, about the gimmicks, the image, everything that I hated about every bit of my career, I felt like I was just put right back into it. And we're going to just make you artificial once again. Ice quedó profundamente decepcionado con el resultado del programa. Había vuelto al ojo público, pero ¿a qué costo? The very fact that one gets invited to participate in surreal life is in many ways an announcement that you are a has-been, that you are now a joke. As easy as it might be to disparage the fame that comes from being on a reality show, fame is fame. And also it's a very astute career move on his part on some level because he's still making music. So in a sense, all these reality shows he does are really free publicity for his, uh, for his music. I think the reason that Vanilla did reality TV was because he wants to stay relevant. I mean, you know, what star doesn't? Vanilla Ice casi se había vuelto una caricatura de sí mismo. Era hora de regresar a donde todo había comenzado, la música. Tras desaparecer del ojo público a finales de los 90, Vanilla Ice logró encontrar un nuevo vehículo para sí mismo, los reality shows. Reality TV really gave him a second career that's been quite substantial. So in a way it allowed him to reinvent himself with a different kind of fame. Pero finalmente se desilusionó con el género y decidió retornar a sus raíces. The image, the bios, the, all these things is not what music should be about. It's about that personal connection that you can make. En 2008 lanzó un nuevo disco llamado Vanilla Ice is Back. Aunque el disco no llegó a las tablas, Ice continúa entreteniendo a un grupo de grandes fanáticos. Play 100 shows a year, and now I, I, I'm so happy that I'm grateful that I still get to make my music and people still appreciate it. People still, from it seems like five years old to grandchildren to children, they still flock to see this man wherever we go. My fans today, loyal. They will be here today. Tomorrow, the next day, and that's why you can take a critic and give him one of those. Because I'm, a, I don't care about critics. I care about my fans. Y Ice también ha logrado evitar los clichés de otros éxitos fugaces. He's actually really avoided this whole pop star going bankrupt cliche because he's made really smart investments with his money. Unlike a lot of stars, he wasn't going out and buying 10,000 square foot house, you know, and like five Lamborghinis that he didn't need. Pero la fuente de felicidad más grande de Ice siempre ha sido su familia. A lot of times in his family, his daughters, and his wife, and his household, his being the father, the husband, is his number one priority. Everything pretty much that we do is a family affair. You know, if he's not working, we're together 24-7. People like stop you and sometimes that can get annoying. Everyone just like... Excuse me, can I take a picture or like an autograph or something like that? They just like come up to us and like 
sad. Come on. You know, family and friends are what this thing's all about. Material things, and fame, or whatever, you know, you're not born with them and you're not going to die with them. Your family is forever. Hoy, cuando Ice no está haciendo música, disfruta de la vida en su propiedad de 80 hectáreas en Florida. You think he's hungry? Ice y su esposa ahora tienen dos hijas jóvenes There he is. y un conjunto impresionante de mascotas, incluyendo a Bucky el canguro. Incluso llegar a los 40 no ha detenido a Vanilla Ice. Aún compite regularmente en motocross, lo que le ha dejado unos cuantos huesos rotos. Both my ankles, my leg, both my wrists. Arm, fingers. It happens. How many guys do you see at 40, you know, jumping over stuff like that? He's like a kid. I just enjoy being a jackass, I guess. <laughs> It's the proper term. Get back. <laughs> get back. 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 You all right? You all right? You're okay. Hey. Sea lo que sea que el futuro le depare, hay al menos una razón por la que Vanilla Ice jamás será olvidado. It could be at a wedding, it could be at a, a bar mitzvah. When that song comes on, people get up. Oh my stop, collaborate and listen. I sit back with my brand new bitch. That is a cool little song. There are very few people who have contributed to the culture something like that. Back in the day, you, me, everyone, we were all listening to that song. We were all jamming on it. It was number one. Y la canción continúa siendo parte de la jerga de la cultura pop, incluso hasta hoy. If you've seen Eight Mile, there's a scene where Eminem free song in a club, he's in an MC battle. Somebody invokes Vanilla Ice. Somebody says, hey, look, it's Vanilla Ice, and Eminem has to deal with it. In the movie Step Brothers, there's this fantastic scene involving a high school talent show where Will Ferrell's brother wins the entire competition by lip-syncing Ice Ice Baby. And it shows the parents reminiscing about that talent show victory. Oh, that's a great song. It is. Mm. And it is. Alguna vez amargado por el maltrato de la industria, hoy Vanilla Ice se reconcilia con su pasado. I have made peace with my past. I've made good peace with my past. In fact, I enjoy everything I used to hate. You know, sometimes you got to get rid of some old demons to move on. And I think he's doing that. También está comenzando a ser reconocido por su papel en traer al hip hop a la cultura pop masiva. It actually ended up being, you know, the first rap song ever to hit number one. This was history. You look at an artist like Vanilla Ice, whose fame was quick and dirty, but he really did pave the way for a lot of entertainers that came after him. CNC Music Factory, Marky Mark, even, to a degree, Eminem. Kid Rock came out on TV and he says, man, if it wasn't for Vanilla Ice, none of us would be here right now. And then Fred Durst did the same thing. And I was just like, wow. Tras una vida de altibajos tan extremos, quizás el legado más grande de Vanilla Ice sea su capacidad para resistir. He survived it by being smart. Because in the music industry, obviously, you never know when you're going to be up or when you're going to be down. I've been treated fairly. I've been treated unfairly. I've been ripped apart and put back together. And what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I'm a perfect example of it. <laughs> He's definitely part of the pop culture canon now. They can't write him out of that history. Love him or hate him, Vanilla Ice has endured in pop cultural history. There's never been another Vanilla Ice. He set a benchmark, and I'm waiting for somebody to top it. A lot of them's tried. But they're here today, gone tomorrow. He's Rob still here. I ain't going nowhere, man. <laughs> I got my family, I got my music, and I'm a survivor.